So the story of Christ with all the stations of the cross, even if canonically speaking, and that's what we did this attempt, it's that what unfolds within the spiritual anatomy. This is what we all live, the questions we all faced. All the characters, all the apostles there, all these are aspects of our doubts. All this, from the betrayal of the Judah to the last doubt of the St. Thomas, the last encounter. Yesterday you brought up a book, um, and it, it triggered something important in me, and it was The Master and the Margarita, um, and it was a chapter, I think it was the second or third chapter, um, you've read the book, uh, uh, Pontius Pilate, and uh, the scene with uh, Jesus, and uh, it was such a powerful scene to me at that moment that uh, I wanted to learn Russian just so I could read that chapter in, uh, in uh, sort of the author's original spirit and so so some of the this question has to do with the power of um, inspiration because i think dostoevsky said something similar he said and again i'm going to butcher this and i apologize especially because of the russian influence but um but he said something to the effect of uh you know if you tell me jesus isn't real then i want to live in an imaginary world where he is or something something like that and so this summer i went to uh to galilee um just to see what it was all about and uh um and if any, I don't know if how many people have been, uh, it was very unremarkable. And I don't mean any, this on the internet, so I apologize to anybody who lives near there. Um, it was, it's, that's really what struck me about it was how unremarkable it was. Like, first of all, this, when they say the Sea of Galilee, it's a lake. It's, it's small. The, the, the village is small. You know, you, you read about this figure, and he was small, you know, uh, allegedly. And, uh, and then you, you see this little town and his tiny town, you know, and then this hill that he gave this teaching on, this tiny little hill, and, uh, and he's speaking to little people, you know, fishermen, uh, villagers, farmers, you know, you know, not, you know, you can't, speaking s simply, you know, simple teachings, and yet here's me in 2023 going, feeling drawn to this town, you know, this is, so this guy is in this town a thousand years ago, give you know speaking what he's speaking teaching the way he's teaching and and thousands of years later you know you, you anywhere you go in the world um you you mention that name and uh you know you just say what what's what day is it today or what year is it you know and and so the the impact of that you know hits the world like a meteor um to where we measure time by that now you know and I feel like there's a need for a reconciliation with that, uh, that heritage in the spiritual sort of traditions that it's easier for us to speak about, um, uh, you, you know, Sri Ramana Maharshi and these great, great teachers, but, but somehow this, this particular one is, is poisonous, almost toxic. You, if you say it out loud, you know, you get the sort of, either a fanatical look or, or some sort of, you know, this, there's a strangeness around that. I'm talking about Jesus. Yeah, and yet you read, you know, I went back and I read some of these things now as a man, uh, having been on this journey for 20 plus years and listened to so many of these brilliant, brilliant teachers, and I come back and I'm like, my God, the, the beauty, you know, and just struck by that. And, and I just was wondering, A, the, if you feel the need um, in the culture, that there's this sort of need for healing that relationship, or just, um, uh, or if there's a path to do that, because it feels like all of the teachers, you included, is are are treasures, you know, treasures, you know, to to humanity, that that ought to be elevated and preserved, regardless of the of the of the specifics, and they don't belong to any institution; they belong to us, and and that teacher in particular belongs to you know, the, the people, the fishermen, the people that can't fly to Mexico and, and attend a retreat. You know, it's such a vital, um, such a vital teaching and, and there's such a power in it um, that I think it, it, it gets overlooked and, and, uh, and uh, almost ridiculed by, you know, uh, in, in a lot of circles today. 
And I think there's a lot of loneliness in the culture and a lot of despair in the culture because of that. You know? So that's just, uh, that's my campfire. Well, funny enough, <clears throat> please, please don't take it uh, in the wrong way. I seems like chosen the right outfit. <laughs> I was, <coughs> was dis deciding between the Western shirt in chambray and uh, salvage one made in Japan, and to, well, maybe this is more fitting, and there we go. But let me speak something then in turn also personal, intimate, in, in exchange of what you share. Something maybe you don't know, or you might have heard somewhere, because some of these have been spoken inevitably. I mean, not as a, in any way, part of the teaching, simply as part of sharing my personal journey. As a matter of fact, there are a few very remarkable set of circumstances where I made me to find, in a way, my way home precisely through the figure of which you speak, of whom you speak. And it may sound a bit overly, overly even intimate, but I'll nevertheless share this. I was brought up by a single woman. I'm the only son. I've never met my dad. I don't even have one physical memory of that encounter. Because he, mom and dad separated when I was probably about two years old. So I don't even have that, you know, the, any kind of sensation of having father. So I was brought up by uh, my mother and later on she told me some quite an unexpected stuff when I was in my already 20s. And what she said to me is that in the moment of despair, uh, when she was very, very well, having a hard time to balance all the books and, you know, the whole act, she just being completely and utterly um, living life of a um, secular, secular life, right? The, the background where she grew up, there was, you know, if, uh, she came from the house which was Uniats, and the church which was destroyed in Soviet Union, in Greek Orthodox, Uniats known as, a branch of the Byzantine offshoot. Uh, so the only person in uh, my mother's environment was her auntie. And so there was the very strong influence from that. But her household, her mother and her father, were not at all religious in that sense. And that wasn't the time when, if you were religious, to propagate that or make it public anyway. My mother was born in 1934. So <clears throat> she was, you know, the Soviet Union, you know, her childhood is a Second World War evacuation uh, behind the Ural Mountains and coming back and studying in Odessa, beautiful city, and being sent to Uzbekistan to, you know, like that whole shuffle. And that's where she conceived me and that is where, where I was born. So she, in a moment of despair, had this kind of like communion with Christ. And she simply asked Christ to father me because she could not possibly bring her son by herself. 
when she shared that with me, of course, it was like uh, deeply revelatory because by then I was already um, have quiet directions in life I took. And you'd be probably surprised to hear that the very first scripture I ever read was a Bible in Russian language. It was brought to me from Poland by the mother um, of my daughter who lives in Poland. Uh, on my request, it's, I still have that copy. It's small like this, beautifully bound. It's the first scripture I ever read, Bible. Uh, it was very difficult to read, of course. As Bible is, right? You get, you get lost, sleepy, and uh, you know all this kind of like. Well, when when do we get to the, you know, to the <laughs> it's more like a history book. But then, of course, when it comes to the part to the New Testament and the all the Gospels, that's where it struck me. You know, the reading of the Gospels. This is. I was a student at the St. Petersburg Academy of Arts. So kind of like uh, having immediate friends, all like King Crimson, kind of like, you know, like we, we already spoke about that Led Zeppelin was a passe, you know, that Pink Floyd was already behind us. All that avant-garde rock. So not much conversations could happen there. Next door, the Hare Krishna guys, you know, coming back from walking on the Central Street in St. Petersburg and Nevsky Prospect, you know, Hare Krishna, Hare Ram. <clears throat> so it was a kind of a solitary affair, trying, reading it, making sense, walking the streets of St. Petersburg, the streets of Dostoevsky, pretty much, you know, streets where the characters of his famous novels, you know, they. They are there, they're, they're kind of like accurate streets, you know. In the crime and punishment, there's a walk of crime and punishment where he walked when he, when that decision crystallized to commit that crime. So this, this is something I wanted to share with you, with you all, and since you brought it up in response. So... Later, and this you might have heard because I shared that publicly, the only pilgrimage I ever did was to the cave on the mountain where Mary Magdalene performed her sadhana in the south of France. See? So I'm quite eclectic in my background. So this is why I'm... It's like some people can't stomach it, they can't get it. You know? I remember reading this comment under one of the videos or forums, more like forums. You should try check this guy out. If you can get past through his sense of humor, you know, because not everyone does. This is why, you know, it's like Western shirt or a kind of Kashmir shawl, you know, with some kind of cross. It's cross is like elements there. Just so, it's very difficult to find real, truly integral teaching in the teachings of Christ. And this, I'm speaking from very personal revelations. During my sadhana, most of my, let's say, uh, visions were all Hindu-like, to my surprise. They were Hindu-like, they were all the deities. And, but the figure of Christ had always very, very central, I would say, um, status in a sense that it represented the very uh, bhava, that feeling at the heart of all feelings. So this is why it would have been very easy for me to go in that direction. And I 
tried in the earlier years to, to see if this could be possible, you see. But anything that I read, anything that I read about Christianity, including the extraordinary theologians, sooner or later had this sense of too much history, if you will. It's too much history and too much policies. It's at some point the inevitability of the fact that we don't know truly what Christ's teaching was like except for the Gospels which are quite different from one another. They're not all the same. And one of them, as you know, stand out in its starkness in contrast to all others. Right? Because of its very unapologetic, almost uh, commanding and some even scholars spoke of it as aggressive tone. Christianity, yes, exactly. We live in a time which is only recently has been adjusted as before common era. But I still remember when it was spoken before Christ. So this adjustment is fairly recent. What, 20 years? Maybe 30 maximum, right? Scholarly speaking, when you come across BC, it meant to be understood as before Christ. And only then it was decided to change, to make that more democratic, so to speak. And BC started to stand for before common era. Common era, era of Christianity. But why that is? And this is most perplexing. And we know that Christianity was used as a political tool, the teaching, to save the disintegrating empire, to use the sacred teaching to glue back disintegrating fabric of society to create cohesion again where this disintegration we could argue that perhaps this was the faith of all religions I mean all religious revelations all revelations one way or another become political or politically become enmeshed in the affairs of the ruling classes who simply see this as an opportunity not to be missed. So the council at Nicaea could be seen as crystallization of Christian faith, but it could also be seen in a different way. The very term blasphemy is what gave already then what sanctified killing awakened people burning drowning so of course it comes out of no surprise that it happened almost simultaneously that kind of re-evaluation of that whole Christendom among the very very advanced psychologically beings that Nietzsche, that Dostoevsky was. It, because it takes tremendous degree of courage. And that courage is not just the courage to face something. Like courage to speak to the authority of thousands of years of the indoctrination or the doctrine. That, that's some audacity. And it, it was widespread across Europe all the way to Moscow. That re-evaluation. That re-evaluation that brought in a way uh, that phase of 
uh, psychotherapy, which we're still in. The true spiritual work happens mostly in psychotherapeutic realm. Very few people do real spiritual work. Very few can. But everyone has a shrink because life is unbearable. Because prior to that, that job was performed by institutionalized, or by the institution, by the custodians who were taking that edge off. Right? They were the ones who would counsel you. You've done something horrible, you go into the confession and you lighten up that burden because the custodian there is under the oath that that to be between the one who unloads and God, right? So, you know, that's, we know that's not, was, was not always true. We know that many, many clergy worked for secret services widely, everywhere. It was very well known. And it was also used as well. So there were a lot of false confessions given. So, the, you know, the, in the city of Tehran, where all the secret services drink good coffee, historically, you know, know each other and pretend they don't. From British to you know, Russians to Germans to Mossad latents, all this is very well known. So this, how, do you, how do you teach them? So some way I, uh, <coughs> in one of those expositions when I just felt like I was meant to talk something but then something else came out. Uh, it was at Sun, Science and Non-Duality. There's one talk. Um, where I kind of spoke to this, that that whole energy, that whole power, that whole Shakti, went into arts in Christianity. Since the teachings of Christ could not flow through the passages from heart to heart, <coughs> because this kind of transmission was terminated. Cut. Institutionalization was meant to indiscriminately destroy those uh, nucleus of true teaching. It, I mean, you know how many films were made about Christianity? Maybe just as many probably as about the Second World War. There's like, I don't know, the cowboys and, right, and Native Americans, Second World War, and films about Christianity. Is there one film about what actually happened? Is there one? I'm just wondering. One. Film, to, to make film how it might have been. We can only speculate. Yeah, we've, we've seen films about going with very, very unapologetically reevaluating critical assessment of inquisition of this, right, of the murderous nature of the institution. Yes, all this is made. But I would love to see a film about those early centuries, maybe first two centuries immediately after Christ. So in other words, where that breath was passed on and those who were alive were setting up, starting these communities. And there were this like nucleus of light. If you go into space and look down, you could see how the whole, probably, Southern Europe, Middle East, North Africa, right, were all lit by this little nucleus of light. And of course, when the news of that reaches the authority of the dying, infected, nearly paralyzed world, 
rotten to its core because that's what Byzantine, not Byzantine, Roman Empire was at the end of it, right? We know that. Just they were like all interbred, right? Then all killing each other, all like, like it was, this is horrible. I mean, chronicles. I mean, it was just, you know, then, then it takes one clever council. Well, let's just turn the whole thing. And then get together in the council of Nicaea, one second one, and organize the whole thing. And then we can do the crusades against the real teaching. We'll go and we'll find every community and we'll suffocate them unless they become all subordinate to the, what the Council of Nicaea have decided. Because before that, I guarantee you, all these communities had their own unique ways. They all sang their own song. They all carried the teachings. So how do you teach them? How do you bring even? You see? So yes, I, I had the, an attempt in the Tantric Christ to simply give the, the story, the greatest story ever told, in that Tantric perspective. In the Tantric perspective, even using Tantric psychology underneath all the apostles, all the, you know, main characters of the story and what was to me the most important at the very beginning when the idea was born and when we were first supposed to do this in Dallas we had planned to do a retreat there where it will be for that thing but then the Ebola there was this eruption of Ebola, remember? Particularly in that part. So we had to cancel the whole retreat and we then moved it with a, dif with a different name than now more uh, explicitly titled Tantric Christ and it was carried in California. Of all the people here, only Lakshman, I think, was there. No? Oh, Kamala was there. Kamala was there. Were you there, Lakshman? Yes, of course you were. I was just checking. <laughs> so, and then we did it again in two years' time or a year time in Mallorca. But the original one was there. And what was perhaps the most important part of that is speaking to the story a relevance of the story not in the sense of the story and then us reflecting on it but the value of the story only in the fact that that story is alive at all times and one way or another we leave that story so that's what makes this into the greatest story ever told. So the story of Christ with all the stations of the cross, even if canonically speaking, and that's what we did, this attempt, it's that what unfolds within the spiritual anatomy. This is what we all leave, the questions we all face. All the characters, all the apostles there, all these are aspects of our doubts, all this, from the betrayal of the Judah to the last doubt of the St. Thomas, the last encounter, the story of Magdalene and so forth. So I did in a way that, see? But I could not really see this to carry this as a teaching. So to me, the force, the power, all went and expressed itself through arts. This is no doubt. As an artist and as someone who, well, just sucker for beauty, as plain as that, I could attest to that, that 
it is the most poignantly expressed in art form, in all art forms, from liturgy to architecture to painting to sculpture. That's why the Shakti. Since Shakti could not move in this realm, it will, I will express myself here. And I experienced this. I experienced this myself. I also talked about it, so maybe no need to have a show anymore. It's getting warm here. But I will add this to simply to kind of like maybe wrap it up. That when I went to Italy in 1997 to spend some time there, like for seven months, rented a villa there in Fiatsali, no, not Fiatsali, Mont Monte Loro. It's about 20 minutes from Fiatsali, 20 minutes from Firenze real slice of Tuscany as it was. Even people who visited me there, they said, how could you find real Tuscany in Tuscany? Because Tuscany by then was already Tuscanshire. Tuscanshire. So, and it was, it was just a stroke of luck. I was like completely going with, the, with the, a dear friend of mine who is not alive. Was, we we were together there. She drove her old BMW, and drove from England, a full car of canvases and main boxes. And so I went there to pay homage and have direct encounter with the heroes on whom I grew up, the greats, the Michelangelos and the Leonardos. Because as a kid, that's what I drew. You know, like when you study art classically, you drew fragments of the face of Michelangelo's David as a part of study. Like literally, there is a sculpture of just lips, not, not this big, just nose, just ear, perfect ear he has. See? Just an eye, a famous eye. Every, every art academy you go, whether it's in Barcelona, Munich, I call the Bazaar in Paris, or where I was in St. Petersburg, or even before that in art college in Uzbekistan. As part of classical education, that's what you do. You know David before you know David. You know every part of David. <laughs> you know? You don't drew his dinky, but you drew his all the other parts. <laughs> so when I so real David, right? There's a replica, quite a good one, in Piazza della Signor, right? Signori. But the real one is put inside into the academy. So it, originally it wasn't outdoors, but so as to preserve this timeless relic. Anyway, to cut this short, because I'm now indulging too much in the story, I have had the greatest disappointment of a lifetime, the greatest disappointment, because I found there and then the sculpture to be pornographic, you know. Yeah, it's grandiose, it's five meters, just a block of marble that he cut out, and then on the pedestal, on the podium, it's colossal, five meter human figure. It's, it's a huge sculpture cut out of one single block of marble. But it's a pornography. I could not enter it. it. It's like, you know, so to me this was, the hero was like slaughtering of, of, your, of your heroes, you know, like killing of the heroes. The same with many other high Renaissance artists. But what I've discovered instead is that what truly set me off? The primitives of Siena, the early phase of the Renaissance, <coughs> known as, you know, Ducento, Trecento, <coughs> Giotto, 
Pira de la Francesca. Fra Angelico. That's where I had my moments. Packed with tourists, Firenze, Florence, packed. You know, Florence, you've been in Florence, no? It's, it's packed. It's a tiny, beautiful, it's this like, it's unbelievable. It, 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 like literally, they say, you want to study Renaissance? That's the cradle, that's where it came from. The whole ideas of the Renaissance came, not from Rome, from Florence. So to run away from all these queues, from all these like crowds of tourists, because then the summer came, high summer, I found this little church, this little, not ch church, a little um, cloisters, you know, where the monks live. Monastery, little monastery. It's almost, almost, it's already a city, already Florence, but kind of on a quieter, not quite outskirts, no, it's Florence. Coming in, it's shade, it co it's cool, no tourists, just a couple of people walking. And I go in into these cloisters and this is all painted by Fra Angelico. A very simple, very simple, just after Giotto, so the, none of this display of virtuosity, none of this trying to make it lifelike. This is what I mean pornography. Among the artists, when we look at something and when it's too realistic, we say pornography. You see? So everything can be pornography if it tries to imitate life. Why to imitate life? What for? Art is meant to transform the material into another substance. So it becomes something else. One can argue, isn't that what Michelangelo did with David? Well, to my view, no. He did that with Pietà when he was much younger, with the sculpture which is in St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome. This is a marvel. This sculpture is like really, it, it, it's unbelievable in terms of its impact. It's literally as if not made by human hand. And also scholars agree and critics that it's impossible to classify or to talk about it in terms of styles because it leaps two centuries forward in terms of the treatment of the material as marble, which by then became widespread, most favored by sculptors, whilst at the same time retains the composition, the, f the feeling of the sanctity of the earlier Renaissance painters who were all coming from this, um, they were all com coming from, you know, the, there's the term like orders, they belong to orders. They belong to, even some of these orders were secret orders. The order of Saint Luke was a secret order. Secret order, because the techniques and everything that was taught there was meant to be taught only within and to the members of that order. I forgot the, the right word, there's an Italian word for it. It may come. So, there was not yet the artist standing as this individual who is then begun, begin to command respect of, because he or she, well he, because there were no women artists at the time, uh, is then in demand by the patrons, you see? Whereas prior to that, the only patron is church. The commission comes from the institution and it's always religious, obviously, always commissioned to uh, sacred work of art. And the history of Renaissance is such that it only happened within a very short period of time where the collective work done by people who were, practically speaking, um, anonymous. And that was when the 
cathedral is erected, so many artisans involved and took part in that. You don't know their names, the craftsmen, they're craftsmen, you see. So anyway, this, is, this for me was this revelation, this revelation of the sacred dimension in art. And it remained in the parallel in that transformative spiritual work, see? There is this analogy, I can't explain this. So that, let's say, realization of this um, heroes that I held, you know, like the, the heroes we have when we grow up and you know, we have this um, larger than life etalons of, let's say, of, of, of the best was crushed and something else was discovered instead. And it was deeply, I would say, spiritual experiences for me in 1997. This is where the decision to pay the homage to um, and go to the pilgrimage, to the cave of Mary Magdalene on the Mount of San Buam in Aix-en-Provence. Because in Italy, like that something, I don't know, there was also lunar eclipse, I remember there's this the whole set of circumstances. I was by myself then for two weeks because my friend had to go back, had to travel, fly to uh, tend to her affairs. And I was there completely by myself. It's like really quite interesting experience. And it's tucked away villa. And I had this almost like visitations, like, you know, this kind of, I don't like you know, because I'm not that kind, you know, very down to earth. But it was very, very undeniably some kind of kiss, some kind of like, you know, just don't worry. You know, of course, I was already meditator, I was meditating all over the place. But so I don't know. Yes, I'm, I'm with you in that bashing of the past bashing of the heritage. There were quite few people who have been pointing out um, when I ventured out to see what and who is there, and who, who, are the, who are the movers and shakers, who, who are the teachers of our time, who are the... The way these voices, there was like, for instance, Peter Kingsley, I remember coming across him back 15 years ago, so maybe 16, maybe 17. This is before the social media, just before someone told me. <coughs> remember, I don't know how, how many of you remember, how many of you are old enough to remember blogs. Blogs. Remember blogs? <laughs> and, uh, yeah. People were on blogs, you know? They were a member of a blog, and some of these blogs were very like, you know, you can't get in unless you are invited, unless you are kind of introduced. So, they, so I was a member of one of such blogs and called A Small World run by a very wealthy guy from Switzerland. And yeah, it had that uh, element of exclusivity and of course they had everything they had from ga guys who were into collectors, uh, antique cars to boats to, or, you know, what, what have you. And there was of course niche for spirituality, Buddhism, yoga. So, and I had communicated there a great deal. So this is when I've heard about Peter Kingsley and someone pointed out that uh, I looked and was, he was lamenting that all this fascination about all things Oriental, Indian in particular, like we Westerners are so depreciative, we, you know. But what he was speaking about, not good Christianity, he was pointing to the time of the ancient Greeks. This is where he saw the, the what, 
salvation of Western civilization, literally, in spiritual terms. I don't know whether he still thinks that and to what degree, but we know that there, there, is, a, there is a kind of line of thought, because that's what Nietzsche alluded, but in a more poetic, sage-like manner which was picked up by Martin Heidegger. All Martin Heidegger's early work was all based around that. The very first three books that Martin Heidegger published were Pre-Socratics 1, Pre-Socratics 2, Pre-Socratics 3, I don't know if the fourth was there. This is before Being in Time, where all these early philosopher sages prior to Socrates and what they taught and what and the emphasis of their teaching which survived to our days only in fragments literally just as the excavations from the forum just as this marble copies of the Greek bronzes in the same way we don't have a clear exposition do we know the teachings of Someone like Pythagoras, was reportedly one of the greatest sages of his time. We don't. There's no lineage survived. But it was, right? He had an academy. He had a whole academy. Pythagoras was a deeply you know, philosopher sage, not just a mathematician. Many other figures can be mentioned. So there is this thought that there is within the West, and this is now revived also like someone I had the conversation with last year, Michael Milligan. Michael Milligan, no? Millerman. Michael Millerman is a very bright young scholar in scholar in philosophy and uh, he particularly specializes on uh, Martin Heidegger so some of his talks bringing these teachings of Martin Heidegger I came, came across uh, of one of his deliveries more recent ones in the last maybe a couple months where he brought it out again where, uh, with a bold kind of eye-catching title, you know, that the, the, our future is the ancient Greeks, something like that. You know, our or kind of the survival of our, like, where is, you know, because, let's face it, it's very, very clear that Western civilization, because there is that term, Western civilization, is in the deepest crisis it has ever been. It's, it's in a crisis of unimaginable proportion. And the bankruptcy that we can see of the spirit is the, all, the, all the outer and inner signs that, that are there that in we experience and we witness now is a very clear indication that the plot is lost quite a while ago and nobody knows anymore what is it really for. Those who believe that the technological progress will save us are of course deluded and deluded severely because the brightest minds of the Western civilization have been pointing out a very long time ago, including those aforementioned like the likes of Martin Heidegger, that technology only takes us further away from being. It doesn't bring us closer. One of the most interesting things is, yes, of course, it's not all uh, black and white or clear-cut 
technology here, for example, in our day and age, right now serves as a tremendous source of the spread of information. This is undeniably so. In other words, it's much more difficult to hide and fabricate events in a way that one wished to indoctrinate how events took place, which has happened throughout history for a long time, for a very long time. The counterculture, with all its kind of desire to break the boundaries, you know, this is why I love rock and roll is because, not only because it has this uh, emotional quality to it, I don't listen to rock and roll. Like you, you folks may be thinking, oh, the guy like, you know, probably goes home and goes like, drives his car. And, you know, that's, that's not the music I listen at all. You know, occasionally like something comes across and, and then, yeah, I will you know, put it up a few decibels out high, but that's not the music I listen at all. It's, it's all in the memory, in the membrane of that, what just brings the sweetness, you know, that, so, but why that particular time is important? Because that time was rebelling against the, the hypocrisy that our parents, right? Because the, the counterculture of the 60s is, that's what it may, will make them. We're rebelling precisely against that. And the, it's not a surprise that the counterculture was very much into all things consciousness based, ready to experiment. You know, so therefore, therefore, this widespread of the gurus, leaders, right? Because people were very, very much purer in the heart, much eager to go and experiment and try and venture. There was this spirit. You see, because it didn't take long to see what are they leaving behind and ready to leave it all behind. Likewise, experimenting with drugs, with consciousness altering substances, and dubbing different unusual exotic philosophies and esoteric concepts, for sure. But what was the motivation, driving force? Is for the very first time seeing that it's a charade masquerading us as something real, as masquerading as the value for which we have to give our life, for example, right? It's a serious question. When people one thing is mercenaries. One thing is a contractual, let's say, uh, mercenary trained to kill. And trained, and they receive money for that. But sending people to another country, some of whom will die, under what? Protecting what? It's a serious, serious bankruptcy of the very principles that West purportedly stands for. And the counterculture already saw there. Korea and Vietnam was the shake-up, the biggest shake-up. The movements, particularly in the United States, for equal rights, right? From the time of the, what is it? The movement of the, how is it called? Abolitionists? No? Yeah? How long it took? The Buffalo Soldier. The battalions of African American Platoons were a matter of fact. Just as the Brits used Sikhs 
Absolutely not a single white soldier will die. They will wage the sword of justice against the people of the country by using the people of its own country. So what we're witnessing now is a, a rotten values on a display. See? So I'm not sure how we got here in this particular conversation. But we speak about the civilization, Christian Rome. Because let's not forget, a lot of those who heavily support Israel in the United States, many of these people are actually Christian fundamentalists. Not just supporting Jewish lobby because there's a long tradition of that and a lot of industries and corporations involved. It's business. Sentiment plays some role there. Religious sentiment. But religious sentiment is involved in the top, completely enmeshed in billions of revenue. So that's why it's difficult to teach in the name of Jesus. See? <laughs> it's like, I don't know, putting the hand on the Bible in a court of, ju in a court of justice. What does it mean? Put your hand on the heart and is your heart telling you anything? Or is it already dead? Stone. Not a tomb, stone. At least tomb has some kind of, I don't know, there's something. <laughs> Thank you, Alexander. <laughs>